welcome to the uh, second uh, Mid America Transportation Center Fall Simpo uh, Seminar Series. Uh, today we have uh, Paul Hanley from University of Iowa talking about uh, funding for uh, transportation. Paul is the director of the uh, Transportation Policy Research Group and associate professor, professor of civil and environmental engineering. So, Paul, thank you. Right, thanks, Larry. All right, first of all, you guys got to come closer to the table. And second, um, you all have to take out a piece of paper and, and pencil or pen because this is going to be interactive. You're going to have to answer some questions. So anybody who is out, you know, viewing this on the web, I'll ask the same thing. <laughs> Just... Well, I'm going to use the mic. Huh? <laughs> All right, so if, if the audio is kicking in, would it be better if I use that handheld? You might have to. Okay, how's this? Better? Okay, so today's topic, current and future alternatives for funding of surface transportation. So let's, let's kick this off by, let me ask you, so how do we pay for the roads and mass transit here in our nation? Any ideas? <laughs> well, we could jot them down, but let's go to the street and ask. Nope. Can we get... Is the volume going up, over? No. All right, well, since I know what's on the video, I'll tell you what they're saying. <laughs> All right, so he opens up by saying, good question. I don't know. She says, uh, I think maybe sales tax, property tax. Oh, out in Colorado, what we have is something called a road tax. So he even got his scratching the head down. <clears throat> and this last gentleman says, well, I think there's something about registrations and licensing fees. And she's not really certain at all. So pretty much what they, they laid out there is, is what's in this flow chart here. They're all referring to taxes. And yes, this is how we pay for our surface transportation is a series of taxes. The one that we're most familiar with is the fuel tax. So if you look down at, at my left is the excise tax. So you have fuel tax, which is on diesel fuel as well as gasoline. And there's other types of excise tax that both the federal and the state government charges. And that is, you know, every time you buy a new pair of tires, set of tires, um, you're, you're actually paying into the, the road fund. Okay. And then we take a look at in different <coughs> levels of government. We have sales tax. We also pay for the system through tolls and then we have the property taxes that um, are on your registration so on the vehicle itself on title and licensing fees as well as real estate property tax so let me just take this and break this down into a little bit more of a structure for presentation today um, in transportation world of transportation when we talk about funding we generally look at this in two areas funding is broken down into the revenue side as well as the finance side. Revenue side, how about if we think about this as your, your weekly or monthly paycheck. It's the cash that comes in that you get to spend. Where the finance side is more like when you go out to get a car loan or your mortgage, your house. You're borrowing money to spend today, but you have to pay it back over time. 
So today what I want to do is I really just want to be focusing on the revenue side uh, of our, our funding equation. So remember this diagram again. So how about if we take this apart and look at it from a jurisdictional perspective, federal, state, and local. So if we start with the federal government, the bulk of the money that comes in to pay for the uh, surface transportation, and when I say surface transportation here, what I'm referring to is are the roads, the highways, as well as transit. Okay, what's not included is aviation or any of the waterways, um, you know, shipping, the inland waterways type things. So the federal government, we have an excise tax on fuel, and I'll ask you this in a minute. We all know that we pay both the federal and state fuel taxes, right? So how much do we actually pay per gallon? Does anybody know? Federal. Federal rate. 43 cents. No. 18 cents. Okay. Well, this is where you get to write it down because there's, there's, there's some more slides that come up to see how good you are at, at, at guessing these. So federal government, bulk of the money comes in through the fuel tax. State level government, we rely a lot on fuel tax, on the excise taxes. States also rely on tolling. They rely on property tax, in this case, on the registration and titles and licensing. So how many people have bought in a car recently? And if you're at the dealership, you know, before you get to take the car off the lot, they always say, well, you, know, you have the title and licensing fee, and we'll, be able to, we'll do that for you and charge you couple hundred dollars. Uh, bring this down to Iowa specifically. Um, we have a very high registration rate for our vehicles. Um, they're counted as personal property, so they're taxed as personal property for registration. Um, states also look at general fund revenue. General funds is the money that comes in through things like personal income tax as well as corporate taxes. Okay, and then we have on the local side, uh, oh, and before I move off the state, state also relies on sales taxes. Okay, moving to the local, so this is, if you look at this as, as your county or your city that you live in, uh, where does money revenue come for funding a local? Uh, most of it is from the sales taxes. The vast majority, though, is from property tax, tax on improved property. So taxes on the land as well as any structures on the land itself. Okay, so this, these are the main parts of where the, the money actually begins. Now before I leave this slide, what I do want to point out is as we move from the top of the slide down to the bottom, we're moving more away from a user fee concept where you're actually only paying that tax if you're using a system. So think about that. If you're not going to be driving, if you don't own a vehicle, you're not going to be purchasing fuel to, to power that vehicle. So therefore, you're not exposed to paying that tax. Okay? And it's also proportional to how many miles you drive. So the more miles you drive, the more fuel you burn, the more you're paying for the upkeep and the maintenance of the, the road system. But as we start moving down this list, you see that the tie to the system usage weakens. So much so that you can look at the general sales tax at the local level. You're paying that regardless of you using the road itself. Now, we'll make arguments that it's important because that sales tax also supports the commercial activity. So there is a tie to transportation. But again, it's not as direct as a user fee as the fuel tax itself. And the least is the real estate tax, where you think about this, that's determined not on your usage, but actually on the value of your property. And it's not even necessarily on the frontage, the amount of frontage that you have, you know, the amount of street that you have in front of your house. Okay. I'll get back to this um, more from the, the economics perspective of saying as we break this link between the usage, so the user fee concept, to one where you're not tying it to use. There's a, in the economic um, analysis, you're more likely to overuse or oversupply 
a good when you don't link it to the actual usage. Okay, so come on, let's take a look at one illustration of, of revenue for states. And this happens to be Iowa. And if you take a look at how Iowa, state of Iowa, brings in money to pay for surface transportation. Again, the workhorse is the tax, is the fuel tax. Here in the state of Iowa, we have no tolls, so there's no tolls. We do use general revenue, okay, so, so this is a transfer from the, the general coffers of the states generated through property tax or personal income tax and corporate tax. There's a little bit of a miscellaneous. We have no bonds. Iowa is a state where it's a pay-as-you-go state when it comes to surface transportation. The state will not go into debt to pay for capital operations or maintenance. Okay? So our state government does not solicit or, or borrow money to pay for the roads. Okay? Um, other states do. And the last one is the federal payments. So this is the transfer of the federal fuel tax money into the state. Okay. So another question. So I already asked, how much are you paying per gallon? And this is for the state. And the, the folks on the video here are saying, I'm not sure. I like this person here because he's he owns the gas station and he came in with a federal fuel tax of 80 cents. <laughs> um, so how many people, at least here in this room, and I can't see out uh, on, the, on the web here, but how many people did guess 18.4 cents? Had 18. Had 18. <laughs> right. okay. Not very many people know that. Now, let me ask you this. In a given year, how much do you think a typical vehicle pays in fuel tax? All right, so if you, if you write that down, we'll get to that in a minute. But um, before that, let me also point out that the federal fuel tax has not been raised since 1993, 1992, 1993. Um, at that time, it was set. It, raised by five cents, and it was put at 18.4 cents. And you know how they actually got that through Congress? It was part of a deficit reduction package. And what Congress did at that point was to say, okay, not all that five cents increase was going to the highway trust fund, but part of that was going to the deficit reduction. Okay. Now that's, that's a little bit important um, in filling in a backstory in a, in a minute or two. So now that you know the fuel tax is at 18.4 cents, it has not been raised since 1992, 1993, would you be in favor of raising the fuel tax? Again, just, just think about this. If this was any other business and you have not had an increase in revenue, this yeah. yes. Okay, so so you're you're jotting down, yes. I'm saying no. And and uh, good, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we, we have somebody who says no because my next question would be, well, what if you knew that you only paid roughly two hundred and fifty dollars per vehicle? This is both state and federal tax, so that's about twenty five dollars per month. Would that help change your mind? Uh, no, because I wouldn't trust how the politicians would spend it. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so, so I'm not going to be able to answer that question. <laughs> but, but just think about this. The $25 per month. I like saying this to large groups of people. And how much do you pay for cable? Right? <laughs> okay. So, so, you know, put it in context. Um, you know, $25 per month, yes. Um, we don't like paying taxes, but is that a budget breaker? Okay, so so for everybody who's still saying no, what if, well, I say, what if by law the money could only be spent on 
surface transportation. Congress can't mess with it, and it can't. Would you change your mind? If if there were limits on how much I could fritter away on transit and by planes, yes. All right. <laughs> so so we're getting closer. Um, <laughs> Well, what if some of that money could be spent on transit? What, I, what I'm, I'm leading up to here is part of our work that we've been doing for the last uh, decade or more was posing these types of questions to the general public to, to see, well, what is the level of understanding about funding and financing the road system? So we asked those series of questions, and, and here's the, our, our recent set of results. So we have about 1,700 people who responded to a random telephone uh, survey, and we have just right out saying, would you be in favor of increasing the fuel tax? 29% are in favor. 60% no. Your company. <laughs> well, what if you condition that on if you knew you only paid that $25 per month? And, and we vary how we, we state this so we're not biasing um, our respondents. So of the 60 who said no, we get us a move, 15% are now in favor of it. So you're up to 38%. And then condition that again based on, well, if you knew that by law the money could not be spent on anything other than surface transportation, we see that we spike it up and we're close to 50%. Now here's this question about, well, what if there was a law that didn't allow this to be spent? Um, most people actually don't know that law exists. The highway, the Federal Highway Trust Fund, the money that, the, the fund that collects the, for the most part, the, the fuel tax can only be spent on surface transportation. Yes, well, part of it goes to transit and, and beautification projects, but not majority of it. <laughs> most states also have the state fuel tax protected by law that it can only be spent on surface transportation. So it is tying the use, where, where the money is being collected to where it's being spent. Okay. And then here's the kicker. It finally pushed it over to the 50% mark, and that is, well, what if we could spend it on transit? Then we did get that little bit of a bump. We got a 2% increase, and it gets above 50%. And this has been a pretty steady for the last six years um, series of responses. As people get more and more information, they become more and more favorable for increasing the fuel tax. Okay, so I don't have the slides up here, but I, let me talk you through um, why relying on the fuel tax really is not the best bet to take. And that is what we've seen is a changing economic environment when it comes to fuel taxes. Now, I'll take you from 1950s to the mid-2000s. Here in the United States, we were growing VMT. VMT was increasing on average about 3% per year. Okay? So if you think about how the fuel tax itself is pretty static, we were still increasing the amount of revenue that was coming into paying for the roads or surface transportation because we were driving more and more each year. Okay. Well, then something kind of happened in 2004, and what we started seeing was a decrease in the increase of VMT. Kind of like I'm from Washington with the, so that's a cut. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we started seeing was this, there was a slowdown in VMT, and that actually happens to correspond with, with some of the things that, that we've been finding is in 2004 happens to be the first year where the net disposable or discretionary income hit zero for households in the United States. We were borrowing a lot of money, or personal money, to, to keep our household budgets in balance. So we started at that point um, having to make serious decisions and trade-offs, and one of those happened to be uh, traveling less. Okay. Then what we've seen in 2007 with the economic recession is we started losing the commercial traffic. And VMT, for the first time in U.S. history, actually in 2007 was less than what we drove in 2006. And that continued through 2009. So 
think about this. Our fuel tax hasn't increased. Our VMT has decreased, and now it's beginning to pick up a little, but it's, it's fairly leveling off. So revenue is not keeping pace with cost. Here's the other part of the, the equation. Since the 1970s, we've doubled fuel efficiencies of vehicles. Right? In 1976, I would be really proud to say, my car is getting eight miles per gallon, and that was high efficiency. Right? Now the fleet is at 24 miles per gallon. And with the new um, CAFE standards, the rules that, that have been put in place, it's going to double by 2025 to 56 um, miles per gallon. So again, if you think about relying on the fuel tax, that's not going to be the, the workhorse that it has been in the past. So the governments are looking at alternatives. So if you look at, back to this slide, it's not that the fuel tax and, and the excise tax is not going to be important. It still is. But we're going to start relying on, on these other types of revenue more and more. And how we do that? Well, let's take a look at the states. Here's an illustration of every state that allows a local sales options tax to be put in place and dedicated to infrastructure, in this case for surface transportation. And that's not how the United States used to look. So right now, most of these local sales taxes, they're, they're sold as penny taxes. So we'll, we'll increase your sales tax by a penny. Right, which they're referring to as a 1% increase. So let me ask you this. If we were to rely more on sales tax, you as a consumer, you as a driver, would you be interested in increasing sales tax to support road infrastructure or surface transportation? Okay. Yeah, so, so if you could track your responses to see if you fit with the national perspective or not. Well, let me take a little bit of a time and, and talk about the California experience. So in this case, California has really relied on the local sales tax to support road infrastructure. They have a 25-year 25 25 history of doing this. 20 counties have approved local sales option taxes. They generate about $2.5 billion per year in the state of California. And the research that has come out of California Berkeley and UCLA, Marty Wax and, and Brian Taylor, um, they've looked at why has it been so successful in California, and they find here are the four points. One, each of those proposals has to specifically identify what is going to be built or improved. So it's, it's a detailed listing of what I'm going to be putting the sales tax towards. It requires voter approval. So it, it comes up for a direct vote. So it goes back to Will's concern about, well, maybe the politicians aren't uh, you know, applying the money the way you might want it. So it's a direct user vote. The money can only be spent in the county in which it enacted that sales tax. Right? So it keep, it's kept local. And it actually has an expiration date it doesn't automatically get reinstated. If they want to continue it, it needs to go back to a, vo a vote. Okay. I got myself in, in a bit of trouble when I was presenting this to the League of Cities, and we just recently experienced locally um, one of our jurisdictions failed twice in a row now on doing a local sales tax for infrastructure. And they violated most all these points in having a wide open selection. They wanted to please everybody, so they put money all over the place, um, and the voters continually rejected. Okay, so so let's go back to the national look. So right off the bat, only 18% of the people polled would say yes, we're in favor of increasing the sales tax. Well, what if we limit it so it can only be spent on roads, or in this case, surface transportation? Well, we get a big bump. Uh, you get up to 34%. But that's about, that's it. Um, we don't get it any higher than that in the, in the general poll. Okay, so let, let's move to the other option, the other alternative that, that is being explored, and that is tolls. How many people have driven 
recently on a toll road? Right? Now think about that funding mechanism. You drove on that road, you paid for driving on that road, and that money comes back for the most part to supporting that road. Right? Okay. So again, it, it ties this a little bit more to an equity issue of only those who are using the roads are paying for the roads. It's not coming out of the general funds. Okay. The other question that we asked was, well, if you had an existing toll in your area, would you be willing to increase it? And I'll get to the answers, but here's the layout of, of what states allow tolling. Now, the interstate system. The interstate system, I'll get to in a minute, up until June, had a long-standing prohibition from tolling new um, or, or any of the interstates that weren't already tolled before 1956. Okay. But we are allowed to toll bridges and tunnels. So here are the states that have interstates with interstate toll and tunnel tolls. And non-interstate bridge and tunnel tolls. So you see that this is a somewhat of a, a popular method of, of raising revenue. Again, interstate toll roads. So again, these were the tolls that were already in place before the interstate system uh, was designated. So they were allowed to continue the tolling. Non-interstate tolls. So it, you also could see this is fairly regional. Um, you know, the East Coast from Maine down to Florida, uh, both interstate and non, many of the states opt for tolling. And this is a, the proposed financing and construction tolls where now using toll revenues you can actually plan and build the roads themselves. Okay, so, so this, that was the picture before June of this year, uh, before MAP 21 became law. So that was yesterday. Yesterday was long-standing prohibition on no tolls for existing interstate highways. Today, MAP 21 just opened up the door for both tolling interstates and non-interstate highways on the national uh, system. There's two sections within the law, sections 129, which is the general tolling program, and section 166, which is the high occupancy tolling program. And I'll detail what these two mean and perhaps the implications on, is this a viable um, competitor for the fuel tax itself? Okay, so looking at the general tolling program, section 129, we are now allowed to toll all new capacity. Okay, so all new capacity. You can't touch any of the existing lanes. If they're in place, you can't place a toll on them, but anything new that you build can. And that revenue itself has to be used for only these, these items. One, debt service. Also allow for an adequate return to private investment. You can use it for operations and maintenance of the roads. You can use it for a, a P3, the public-private partnership payments. And after you accomplish all those, if you have excess, then you could spend it on any of the other uh, programs within the transportation Bill. Now, with that comes a yearly audit, so the new tolling systems have to have a yearly audit, and they no longer need permission, so a state and local government no longer needs to go into a tolling agreement with the USDOT, um, so there's, there's not a federal oversight of, of approval. Okay, section 166, which is the high occupancy tolling, again, now that opens up that any of the existing, or excuse me, any new lanes that are added to the existing system can be tolled as a high occupancy um, lane. Revenues, again, can be used for the same goals as um, pro, or section 129. And now they added some more requirements that if you do this, now you must have an enforcement program. So you have to catch the people who are trying to beat your tolls. There has to be an automatic tolling. So there's no toll booth. Right? And you think about this, you know, if, if, if I had more time, I would talk about 
our, our focus groups up in the, the Chicago area that before the tolls went in, they said they were the worst things. Afterwards, they said it's the best thing because it reduces the congestion. Don't have to go through the toll booth. Um, you can they have to vary the toll based on congestion, so it, it changes based on how many other people are using the road, and <coughs> that all the systems have to be interoperable. Um, so if you are using, for example, I'll just pick two that come to mind. If you're using the iPass system in, in Illinois, that's easily used on the Easy Pass system on the East Coast. That's, they have to be interoperable. They also need an annual audit. And once again, they don't have to have a tolling agreement between the jurisdictions um, as they had in the past. So think about this. This is now kind of really opening up a new future on, on could we start looking at a stable source of, of revenue coming in for, for um, surface transportation. Now I just put this up as an illustration. Up in Minneapolis, um, we do have two variable tolling facilities, the 395 corridor um, that's going east and west into Minneapolis has a variable toll lane, so there's five places that you can enter and exit the toll, um, and that changes from zero up to a maximum of $8 for the use of that toll lane, and that varies based on the congestion. The operating target is that the vehicles have to, the minimum speed would be 45 miles per hour, the target is 55 miles per hour, the speed limit, um, so that's how they vary the toll um, to keep that in check. And the other toll facility is the uh, 35 West Corridor, again, coming into Minneapolis. Okay, so back to our national poll. Um, would you be in favor of increasing an existing toll? Right off the bat, 31% said yes. Well, if it can only be used for that road, uh, we're up to 50%. Now, take this compared to if you're going to create a new toll. And if you're creating a new toll, only 32% of the population is in favor of that. Okay. So this gets back to what I was saying is the experience. When people have actually experienced the tolling, the reduction in, in congestion, um, they're more likely to be in favor of the toll itself than somebody who has yet to experience the tolling. Okay, so look, let's take a look at property taxes. Are you in? It would be interesting in increasing the registration fees. Again, you, you know we're in a hard situation. We don't have a lot of money uh, to pay our, our bills. Would you be interested in helping us out by paying more in registration fees? I know we're all fine. <laughs> all right, so, so here, here we go again. National polls, again, right off the bat, about a third of the population would say yes. And then it jumps up once you say, once again, that this money can only be spent on the roads itself. Well, how about let's take a look at some new taxes that are being proposed. Whether they, they make it past the draft board, who knows. But what we're looking at is energy tax. So how about if we just kind of even think about scrapping, charging, for gasoline or, or taxing gasoline and diesel, but actually look at this book by gallon, but tax it based on the BTU. And then if we do that, we could capture all the energy that can use can be used to uh, propel the, the vehicles themselves. Okay. Or a carbon tax. By the way, those two don't really make it very far in most legislatures. And then the third one is a vehicle mile travel tax or a VMT tax. I like to say user fee, because it is towards the top of, of the tie. So in this case, what we'd be doing is charging pennies per mile. And that can be broken down either a flat rate, so everybody pays the same rate. So here's another quiz, but I don't have a national poll on this. How much, on the average, during the United States, do we pay per mile in taxes? For every mile that you, you drive, on average, how much are you paying in fuel taxes? Just, yes? Just federal law. Federal and state. The average federal and state. Three cents. Divide that by two. 
It's 1.6 cents per mile. Or you could think about charging that as a variable rate and varying it based on the fuel type, maybe the fuel efficiency, so you might want to reward somebody who's in more of a green vehicle than a, a, a fuel hog. Um, and you could vary it based on location, for example. So we did ask this, again, in the national polls. What about adopting the mileage charge? And where did it go? I don't I must have missed it. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you what, what the national poll says. Right off the bat, um, you get only about 15% of the people saying, yes, this is a good idea. After you caveat it, and you explain what a mileage charge is, you might get it up to 20, 25% um, of the, the individuals. And I, I want to do that, just mention that because for the last six years, what we've been doing here at the University of Iowa is doing a national evaluation of the mileage charge, a you know, fully electronic system that would be based off of knowing where the vehicle is, how many miles have been traveled. Now let me also say, in this case, all we needed to know was if the vehicle was traveling in what state or what taxing jurisdiction so that we could apply the appropriate state rate at that moment. It didn't look at what routes or specifically where the vehicle was. It's just saying, are you in the state of Nebraska or aren't you? And then that information was transmitted over the cellular data network. Um, to the University of Iowa, and no, our building's not that tall. Um, <laughs> but at that point, uh, we would collect the total miles tra traveled, we apply the billing amount, and then we would invoice our participants for uh, how many miles they traveled based on the f equivalent fuel. Okay. And here's our study sites. We had 12 study sites, and they were spread across the United States. We varied them based on large metropolitan areas, intermediate metropolitan areas, and rural um, regions. So we had a, a great demographic cut of the population. We had over 81,000 eligible candidates who wanted to be in the study. We ended up enrolling and completing uh, 2,511 with only a 5% dropout. And our participants matched the national demographics on age, gender, education, income, commute time, and self-identified political affiliation. So we had, a, we had a good pool of, of individuals. So after the two years, each, let's back up for a second, each participant uh, was in the study for a 10-month period. We collected their driving data for eight of those 10 months. Um, so those 2,500 participants total, they drove 22 million miles. And that's quite a bit. Um, and so that averages out to about 1,200 miles per per vehicle uh, per year. <clears throat> so with the 22 million miles, uh, we were able to actually track, oh, shouldn't use that word, uh, we were actually able to locate that vehicle precisely with the GPS um, for 92.5% 90, of the time. Um, the other percent of the times, the GPS unit itself was not working, uh, but we were able to identify based on their past the last position, which jurisdiction they would have been in. So, so we actually had quite a good uh, accountability. We had over, we were able to account for the miles by location more than 99% accurate. Okay. We didn't detect any urban or natural canyon effects in disruption of the cellular network or the GPS. Uh, there was no significant data loss using the cellular network. What I'm building up here is. The technology currently exists, um, and it, it's throughout the United States that a system like that is possible. I also point out that our study began in 2005, so now we look back at the technology, and it's almost like carving in clay tablets. Um, technology has moved beyond what we've we've tested. The, our, uh, the Minnesota DOT has a terrific demonstration project going on now, um, where they've actually moved everything into smartphone. Uh, so you just take the smartphone into your car rather than having anything uh, physically connected to the vehicle itself. All right, so the downside of this though, and again what Minnesota is doing is getting around all this, it was a complex process of installing 
the equipment. And the biggest problems that we found that was the follow-up visits. 25% of our participants had to come back after the equipment was installed for various reasons. 8% was directly related to an installation problem. Okay. So if you think about this as retrofitting all vehicles in the United States, this is not a starter. This is no go. And let me again point out that in this system that we were evaluating, we had physically had to connect into the OBD port as well as connect into the electrical bus. Um, and many of the modern cars are designed on the bleeding edge of the electric system. So if you add a third party device, um, very easy to short things out. And we annoyed a couple of our Prius owners by shorting out their entire system. <laughs> Very expensive. Um, okay, so, but from the participants' perspective, our participants coming into the system, their 42% were favorable. So this was a higher percentage than when we stopped people on the streets. And we, we can tie this back to, we actually did a lot of training of our participants beforehand so they knew what a mileage charge system was. Um, after the 10 months exposure, 70% of the people left the study who liked this. And what I'm not showing here is there was a lot of movement. People who came in who were really favorable left very negative, and as well as the other way around. So, so there was movement. People just didn't come in with a fixed opinion and leave with a fixed opinion. Um, all right, so privacy. Privacy is an issue on, on mileage charging. Um, and our participants said yes, 60% believe that no matter what government said, they're still going to be using this to track the vehicles. And part of that was, well then, don't only collect the minimum amount of data that's needed. Don't collect anything other than, let's say, how much I owe and to who I owe it to. But even with those privacy concerns, 70% of the people left the study favorable. And they tie that back to them telling us, well, were favorable because you showed us that the system was reliable, it was accurate, and it was fair. So they, they view this as a viable replacement of the fuel tax in concept. Okay. And, and again, part of that was they were able to audit the bills so they knew how much they were going to be spending and they knew where it was going. What they didn't know was how would it be spent, but um, again, Oh, so I guess I did bump this over. All right, so, so what we're looking at is after we, oh, let me back up. Um, after we, we conditioned the, the national poll, we could get people up to about 45% with enough information explaining what a VMT system is and as well as it being cost neutral to the, the <clears throat> fuel tax that you're paying now. Um, so once that is, is conditioned, we could get about 45% of the general public saying yes. Except if you mention the word GPS, that 45% then drops back down to 26%. <laughs> okay. All right. So I know we're, we started late and we have about five minutes of questions. So with that, I bet I have a bunch of opinions and, and comments. So please let me hear them. Anybody? So Paul, what percentage of the road use tax is spent now on transit? Fifteen percent. Fifteen? Fifteen. Yes. Now one of one of the changes with map twenty one has been to try to bring more efficiencies and flexibility on how other money is being spent. Uh, so some of the enhancement programs are now not mandatory but are discretionary at the state level. Um, so that may address some of the concerns about money that's being collected for the roads or not going necessarily to the roads. Mm -hmm. All right, well, maybe I could put Beth on the spot because she was one of our graduate research assistants on the mileage charge, and she was part of the training situation. Um, any, any insights on 
any of our participants what they said. She was also take, took a lot of the telephone calls. <laughs> uh, it seemed int mostly people who were already familiar with a tracking system similar to um, the Florida Sun Pass or the Illinois I Pass. If they were already familiar with having that kind of technology in their cars, they were much more apt to be comfortable with this system in their cars. So that seemed to be happening faster and a more acceptance of that. Do you have a question online? Finance. If it is VMT, how many years do you envision it will take to implement and become public? Good question. Um, the future of, of our service transportation revenue is going to be that mixed bag of, of revenue sources that, that I've been showing. Uh, there's going to be more reliance on tolling. Uh, that's more acceptable uh, from the public as, as well as the political world uh, as much as we are interested in increasing taxes. The VMT, um, well, what's the future? At the federal level, maybe we could look at some insight at the, um, the Appropriations Committee that the night they were debating about the appropriations for MAP 21, uh, $610 million was deappropriated for the study of the implementation of VMT at the federal level. Um, so that might give you a hint about the federal involvement. Now, with that, is it dead? Absolutely not. Uh, this is a state issue. The state of Oregon is actively pursuing a mileage charge. Jim Whitty uh, from the Oregon DOT uh, is leading the charge. They have already put in place uh, the system, the, the backbone of implementing a VMT charge. Now, it's not the full electronic system. Right? And what, what we tested was uh, you know, the cutting edge technology, but they're looking at, well, how about if we look at different ways of opting into a VMT and paying a fee versus um, having the electronic equipment, giving the driver that choice between systems. Um, so Oregon is very active, as well as state of Washington, Colorado, Nevada, and Oregon, as well as um, Texas is still kicking around the idea of exploring VMT. How long will it take looking at the VMT system in, in Oregon? As long as they get the enabling legislation, which may be next year, they'll have a system in place probably within a year. So two years, you'll see this at the state level. Uh, very good presentation, Paul. I have a question uh, related to the, uh, the privacy issue. Um, I know a number of jurisdictions allow you to just buy a, a pass, right, pay cash for it, and it just tech takes it down. So you really don't have this issue of, if you're worried about it, it's a, it's a card that says you're here, you're here, and it, it goes down, and then you can throw it away. Is anyone looking at that as part of this uh, discussion? I should say in the U.S., of course. Yeah. Oh, within the U.S.? Yes, and one of the very interesting things on the tolling industry, what they've always had was this anonymous account that you can apply. Hardly anybody actually implements it or uses it. It's required to get it through legislation and the acceptance, but people don't use it. Um, so it, will, it is being talked about and built into the VMT systems itself. The expectation would be it'd be very similar to tolling. And just to follow up, more, more of an observation, I, I, I always enjoy when people talk about the privacy issues and they say, I'm worried about people tracking me, and they have a smartphone in their hand, which basically allows a, a company to track you from one place to the other at any time. And when we've seen that many times, so it, it, it goes back to, I think, to your comment that, uh, you know, it's what you get used to. Right. We're very happy to be tracked with a cell phone, but the idea of someone tracking our car using a cell phone <clears throat> kind of makes us upset when they're, they're in fact the same thing. Yeah, there's, there's work actually done on, you know, out of the consumer science folks. Um, the smartphone is a consumer choice. You chose to do that. Uh, the perception of 
putting something like that in your vehicle, government's telling you to do it, big brother. Uh, so so it, it's trying to give the consumer, in this case the driver, that option to choose so that they're willing to opt in. But you, you're right, uh, we give away a lot of our location data without necessarily, necessarily knowing that. You got one. Okay, Valerie has another question. Has any research been done directly asking about variable VMT for freight type organizations, such as trucking companies or large trucking firms? ATA stance is no mileage charging. <clears throat> Um, yes, people have looked at, at mileage charging. There's a study that, <coughs> that was run in, in uh, New York, uh, New York State, and that looked at VMTs for trucking. Um, you know, and just word of mouth that I've heard on the streets is some of the very large um, logistics firms, the trucking firms, you know, the UPS, the FedEx, are not in favor of it, but if it happens, they would say, as long as they are in control of knowing of, of being able to protect their data, so their comp, the competitors won't know their routing, um, that would be a requirement. But yes, um, back to your, your direct question. You know, people have looked at the the freight, the commercial VMT, in a, in studies, and the industry is is against it. Okay, so I guess that's that's all for this week. And again, thank you for uh, starting out a little late with us. We had a little bit of a glitch. So thank you again. <laughs>